So I want to thank uh, Kari Skogland for joining us on the Playlist <laughs> podcast to talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So welcome. Thank you very much. I like your shield back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great, huh? Not quite the same, unfortunately. Uh, since we're going to talk full spoilers here, I have to start by asking what it was like the first time you saw Anthony Mackie in the costume on set. I have to imagine it was pretty emotional. You know, when he walked on set that first time, uh, we all, I think, you know, the whole place went silent because, to, and he, he of course looks m magnificent in it. So, uh, you know, there's just that sort of imposing character, but also just to see this, this iconic costume uh, symbolizing what this, this show we were making and where we were, you know, taking the world, uh, the, not just the MCU world, but the, the world, you know, the fan base at large, a black man carrying the shield and watching Anthony come on set with his wonderful charm and, and good humor uh, was a pinch me moment for sure. Was there uh, any discussion about greatly changing the costume from its comic book uh, counterpart? Because it's, it's probably one of the most accurate uh, comic book to film translations uh, we've seen in Marvel. It's interesting you say that. Uh, we went through a lot of different, very, you know, varying versions of it. I think it was always in that this wheelhouse uh, because uh, it looked great. So you know, there was no reason to change to fix what it wasn't broken. Um, but we definitely spent months. Uh, the design team spent months working with us on, um, you know, just tweaks and bits and because you also want to make it fit the man. You know, so just looking at his physique and what was, what what worked for him. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it sort of came full circle, I guess. You had to add that padding because clearly he's not muscular enough. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be so lucky, right? Yeah. Oh, I had the I had the good fortune one time we were um, all staying in a hotel somewhere, and uh, he was working out in the in the gym and I was working out in the gym. Obviously, not to the same effect, but. <laughs> I thought I, that's another pinch me moment. I, I'm working out with Anthony Mackey. He's over there. <laughs> so uh, one of the more controversial aspects or talked about aspects of the series is the story of John Walker played wonderfully by Wyatt Russell. Yeah. Um, so he's introduced as the new cap and, you know, he's a likable enough guy, but he's kind of put in this impossible situation um, and then you fast forward and he, he murders someone and turns into what fans thought would, you know, maybe be the villain of the story, but ultimately he's kind of almost redeemed by the end, uh, even exchanging some quips with Bucky and stuff like that. Was there ever a discussion maybe of not giving him as much redemption or, or did you, uh, have any hesitation in, in or, or wanting to embrace a darker aspect? Um, no, I think we always knew uh, that he was going to come out of this um, a changed man for sure. Um, and, but, but he had to go on his own journey. And I, what, what was exhilarating was being able to, because he also represents what was uh, the, the, the character uh, to carry the shield. I mean, for me, uh, a lot of this was an exploration of what it is to be a hero today. So if the Captain America was the original, uh, which, you know, Chris Evans uh, embodied um, was that, you know, very warrior hero, warrior soldier kind of paradigm, which was born of an anti-fascist movement, that is, which is how the, the comics came to be um, out of the Second World War. So that all made sense. But then as the world has evolved and, we are facing, you know, different, very, very different um, threats. I guess things like 9/11 changed that. Heroes became first responders. Uh, the pandemic, uh, frontline workers. So the idea of a hero has expanded to to embrace many different meanings. And so it was. I felt very important for us to to um, that that was a big part. The DNA of the discussion was that. So if John Walker represented the old, but he was created to do that. So it wasn't like he was a man just running after power yeah. and you know, to carry the shield from that place. He was a thought, he's a thoughtful guy. He 
is earnest. He and it took us a while to find his absolute tone and and to put give his character the rudder that we needed because uh, Wyatt is by by personality is very funny. So it was really easy to fall into a very you know charming guy. Um, and actually, you know, so we we calibrated back and forth, and then you know found that the earnest, um, hardworking guy who really wanted to make it right, but did not have the 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 makings, the, the inner soul, that is what it was going to take. Because don't forget, Sam isn't a super soldier, so that actually needed to be probably a big part of this new this new idea, this new character was someone who didn't have that baked into his physique that he was going to have to mediate and he was going to have to negotiate and take on the the villain from a very different uh, trying to harness the energy as compared to combat the energy yeah i love that there was so much gray area with him and that he's never you know one thing in this show so he talks about you know he says when they're stripping him of his stripes you built me and now you're abandoning me. And I think that's true of a, a soldier story in many cases. And so it, we really wanted to let him do that. And that, uh, Wyatt brought a lot to the, the conversation as an as a actor and as a thinking actor. Um, he, he really um, helped shape some of that speech and, and through the character helped shape um, m- much of those nuances. So you mentioned abandoning kind of a slightly different sort of abandoning with only six episodes to tell a story. There's plenty of scenes that are likely to hit the, the cutting room floor. Was there a scene that you remember specifically that just really hurt you to cut? No, I don't think so. I think we were pretty efficient because one of the things, um, you know, our goal was to, I mean, I'm sure moments, I probably, it's more like moments that, we couldn't, we just couldn't fit in. Um, because once you're into a track, um, you know, we did, we did a lot of ad living and we did it uh, in order to find that, that lovely chemistry between Sam and Bucky, um, you know, and for it to be feel organic and to feel very uh, impromptu. Uh, it meant that, and, and the two of them are great together. So you kind of let the cameras roll and let them do their thing. Um, and I would say it's more that uh, we had a, a plethora of choices. And so it's, it's more about, oh, I wish I could have, you know, we could have had that little moment in and that little moment sure. in, but a um, uh, wonderful place to be that you could cherry pick. Uh, no, we were pretty efficient about what we wanted in and uh, I don't think much hit the floor actually. So, right. um, and that's a kudos to the script writing of it and also the post-production process of it that we, we were editing as we went and um, so we started to really see the shape of it quite quickly. And then we knew, uh, you know, okay, no, this, we don't need that. So before, there, that's not to say there weren't a lot of scenes that were written, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we didn't necessarily film them. Got it. Yeah. So the show also introduces a lot of supporting characters that have strong ties to the Marvel Comics universe, like Joaquin Torres and, and Eli Bradley. Um, and those guys don't necessarily, you know, they don't have a ton of screen time, but they, they make use of what they had. So were you ever hoping to include more uh, of them in the series or was, was this just part of each character? Yeah. Were you, were you like, no, actually funny enough. Um, uh, Joaquin, we probably added more, um, as the story unfolded, we sort of, we, we realized we could use his character to help us. Uh, in certain cases, tell the story a little bit and get a relationship going with him and and Sam. Um, be, in particular, because after we shot, you know, right at the beginning, him in the in the jeep, and he's such a lovely actor and so engaging that we we thought, ah, you know, I just want more of him. You know, I want to yeah. get to know him a little bit. Um, so uh, I would, and then Isaiah, I think it, for him, it was a you know, could we have had more for sure? Uh, but we needed it to be a really important character um, because I think not only is he an important character in the MCU, but it's where do you fit him in to a story? Because he can't be an also ran. He has to be as important to the DNA of the story as his story is to the MCU. So um, 
what was terrific was that uh, we were able to make him a huge part of Sam's character arc. So he was super impactful. And that, you know, for him, for Sam needed someone, another black man who knew what he was talking about, needed that character to say to him, no self-respecting black man will pick up this shield. And that had to come from Isaiah, as it turned out. And that so became so important to, and then the, for me, you know, another sort of super emotionally charged, chilling uh, goosebump moment is, you know, when he hugs Sam and says, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Sam says, you'll never, they'll never forget who you are, uh, you know, and how the uh, black, the black soldiers and the culture that he came from have served America. And that's super important, but it needed it had to have its own storyline that was not plot driven so that we could get inside the character. So the six hours was the perfect place to be able to put that in with the importance it needed, given that it isn't the, the whole story. So I'm thinking now about, you know, like when we had Don Cheadle as War Machine, you know, show up uh, in the first episode and it's just awesome you know having a rich cinematic universe like the mcu uh to work with where you can utilize you know actors like that did you ever have plans for more of that sort of greater mcu integration or maybe that was just like a slippery slope that you were just trying to avoid <laughs> I, would, I would say slippery slope because yeah. you know uh, as much as you would love to to work in these characters what's the time? You don't have the time, you know? And so it's like a parade of characters. So you have to make sure that they're tucking in there just perfectly, uh, but without, uh, you know, sort of hanging a lantern on them in a way that makes it feel like it's, um, you know, that constant, oh, wow, look at that. Because you fall out too, right? You want to keep it so inside the story that it just feels like uh, it's just part of how you're telling the story versus showcasing and showboating. Exactly. So obviously we wouldn't be doing our job here if we didn't ask about Captain America four, since it's been announced. Uh, is that something you're maybe interested in directing or are you waiting for maybe a season two uh, of, of the well, series? I, all I can say is uh, that if Marvel picks up the phone and calls me, I am answering that call. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I talked to Jack Schaefer for WandaVision and she said basically the same thing. Like you just don't ignore a Marvel phone call. Yeah, I, you know, hey, you just don't say I'm busy. I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Feige's on speed dial. Um, so you could you could argue that the MCU is the most dominant franchise right now in the world because of Kevin Feige, who steers the ship. Um, he gives the filmmakers and the cast and crew the creative freedom to, to go places, of course, but there's always him at kind of the helm. Um, I'm, I'm curious, since you've worked in TV shows previously, and big TV shows, uh, when, you, when you walked into the MCU to do this TV show, was there any difference um, in, in this compared to previous TV shows? And, or were you shocked to see like how Kevin Feige is involved in just kind of everything, his fingerprints are on it all? Well, you know, he operates from a, a wonderful place, which is total inclusion and total respect. So um, as, a, as a sort of creative workspace, he, is cre he has created a very safe uh, environment for everybody to uh, collaborate. Uh, and he came at this from the beginning when we first, very first interview even, saying, we know how to make movies, so that's what we're gonna do. We don't know how to make TV, so we won't make TV, we'll make movies. And that suited me just fine because I wanted to uh, not only make uh, a movie in the six hour space, um, but uh, I wanted it to have a sense of um, cinema. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I got um, unplugged. Uh, yeah, I got unplugged. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a, a so this is uh, you know doing interviews at home is a always a path of discovery. <laughs> that's funny. My, uh, my daughter but, in school. That's the problem. She needed she needed the uh, plug because she's in school. In, in oh, Zoom. that's funny. Um, so so, anyway, so yeah, to, to carry. I was yeah. going to say, um, this definitely, like you said, feels like a six hour film. So when you're in production on this, and this is an MCU production, did this feel like an MCU film or did this feel oh. like uh, 
Kevin Feige saying make a TV show. No, no, no. Yeah, we never. And, and by the way, I never have made a TV show. I mean, I think early in my career, maybe when TV was so defined as TV, mm -hmm. but once I started getting into the more premium entertainment uh, of it and the and the um, uh, cinema of what you know the, the shows that I was working on at the time, these big shows that had Oscar-winning actors and production designers and and, and all that. Um, I think uh, I, from that day said, well, I'm not making, I'm a bit screen agnostic, but nonetheless, I was always making cinema. So I don't think now the audience really differentiates. I, I think they have high expectations, whether it's performance or uh, cinema or com the combination of the two. So that's how I come at it. And this suited, this checked every box because that's how they were coming out. They weren't really saying, oh, we're making a TV show. Oh, let's dumb that down. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. So, uh, you know, we made a movie. So even though the name Winter Soldier is in the title, you could really argue that the series is mainly Sam's story. And when you look at Bucky's story over the course of the six episodes, did you ever feel that he might be getting a little shortchanged? Was there ever a concerted effort to make sure he never felt like a supporting character? No, I always felt that they were kind of because it's it's a, a you know a buddy cop movie by 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 its you know paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like they were uh, of equal weight. Certainly together, you know, you feel that. I don't think you feel. I, I, they're also what I th also was very co conscious of though was that they aren't um, competing for the same space. So. Mm. Right, and because they both are actually trying to find their relevance in the world, the post-blip world. Uh, Bucky is trying to find not only his relevance as a, um, a man, but also going forward, how is he going to exist in a world that he now is in control of for his own himself? Um, and, you know, Sam is similar. He's trying to find his relevance post-blip where the world is, you know, instantly changed and he can't even get a bank loan. So how are these two going to um, go forward uh, in these worlds that they're finding themselves in? They don't know each other. They don't even really like each other. You know, they knew, they knew Cap, that was their point of contact. So, um, you know, it's about these two guys finding a friendship that is going to help them navigate the future. Um, so I think that's of equal weight and I, the, difference is one of them was going to take on the shield and mm -hmm. and you know so by definition that became that is the the you know number one on the call sheet but i think in terms of both performance and the way we approached it was they were of equal story weight yeah and uh just real quick i wanted to to ask just your last question here you are now the first solo female director in the MCU to handle one project. That's, that's pretty awesome. I know the, the delays had a lot to do with that, but did you ever think about that as you were uh, filming this or, or now that it's released now that you kind of are a quote unquote trailblazer in that sense? Um, uh, well, thank you for noticing that. Um, you know, we were shooting concurrently. So actually, yes, I've come out of the gate first, but um, uh, Chloe and, and Kate Shortland, they were filming at the same time. So uh, uh, technically I'm the first coming out of the gate only because it's shown first because of the pandemic and such. But having said that for on behalf of all of us, um, we're very proud, you know, being a uh, female in, or, or any diversity, it takes a bit of time. You can't just open the door and go, oh, okay. Now we've got a bunch of female directors and we've got a bunch of diverse directors. You have to, they have to, it, the process that we're in takes years. You know, it was two years ago that I started this because by the time you've written it, the pandemic had something to do with that, but, uh, and you shoot and so on and so forth. You know, so these aren't instant fixes. And I have to say Marvel is at the forefront of making sure that diversity is, is very much in the sentence that, uh, that they're, you know, saying. And so we're seeing it now roll out, but they were very proactive very early on. Did well, you get to peripherally work with them at all while you were constructing this show? I know they like to do that. 
Uh, no, not really. Other than uh, Kate and I talked back and forth about Valentina uh, here and there. And um, I talked with Chloe about different, you know, we just, uh, we just had different conversations about um, characters and, and uh, what would you do if, and how, how does that look, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, just, it just as, as collaboration amongst, um, uh, you know, uh, fellow teammates um, in, and how are you dealing with X and I don't know the stuff that you do. You call you call your 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 um, teammates, but I, I talked to the guys too. So yeah. uh, it wasn't like it was exclusive to to the women. I, uh, I assume there was a group text uh, with an Oscar picture of, with Chloe saying like, <laughs> "Hi guys." Yeah, when that uh, you know no, I was like, <laughs> yeah, isn't that fantastic? I mean, wow, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, what what I what's marvelous about um, uh, the MCU of it? Well, and Kevin, back to him is his criteria along with his team, which is, you know, Nate Moore and Zoe Nagelhood. And um, uh, he has a marvelous team um, at the core of, of the whole thing is that really what they look for in any filmmaker is passion. So if the passion for the project is there, then, you know, then they've hired well. It's just like, I look for it in the, in casting. If the character is there, I don't have to split, uh, fit square pegs in around holes, you know? So um, uh, fr from their perspective, I would say uh, that's, their, that's their goal is to put, make the right fit. So of course, um, at some point soon, I hope that no one says that we can drop the, oh, you're a female director. Oh, you're a black director. Oh, you're a Chinese director. And just say you're a director. That would be, that's the new goal. Yeah, so uh, we have to wrap up, but I want to again thank Kari Skogland for for joining us to talk about Falcon and Winter Soldier. Uh, we we obviously enjoyed the the MCU and and, well, and the I series. Well, I love all so. your 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 hats and your shield and. Your, <laughs> your, oh yeah, we're, we're nerds. Here. We're nerds. But. <laughs> we have to get you some posters for sure. Uh, Absolutely. By all means, definitely. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was great. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.